If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good. And this show is such a blessing to Mike and I and to our listeners. But it's an extra special day when you get to have a friend on the show, a friend that does brilliant and wonderful work on an ongoing basis. Basis. Today we have Elizabeth Grossman, and, and we got her on the line. Elizabeth, hello, and welcome to Green is Good. Thank you so much for having me on. Lizzie Grossman, we got to know you years ago when you wrote your wonderful book, High Tech Trash, Digital Devices, Hidden Toxics, and Human Health, because we own Electronic Recyclers International, and, and you did such great work and helped platform such an important issue, an issue that grew from a little, little ball, which is now the tsunami that we know it around the world and is getting a lots of attention, but you were really at the beginning. Thank you for writing that green, uh, you know, that green book and that great book. But today we have you on to talk about your new book, Chasing Molecules. And Mike Bookless said something really great about Elizabeth Grossman and, and Chasing Molecules. Why don't you share that with our listeners? I'll tell you what, you listen to the description and what Bookless had to say about Chasing Molecules guarantee you're going to want to read it after hearing this. Booklist says, and this is a quote, Grossman is an eloquent scientific muckraker outing the truth about commonly used hazardous chemicals that are leaching out of everything from plastic bottles to children's toys and infiltrating the biosphere and our bodies to deleterious effect. Wow. Lizzie Grossman. Thank you for joining us, and really, thank you for writing this book. And what inspired you exactly after High Tech Trash to write Chasing Molecules? Well, it was actually what I learned working on High Tech Trash that set me off on the trail of um, what became Chasing Molecules, because when I was working on High Tech Trash, I was introduced to the world of persistent and pervasive uh, synthetic chemicals that are actually getting out of consumer products as well as from industrial sites and getting into the atmosphere and getting into water and making their way into food and eventually into our bodies. And I wanted to know how and why this was happening and perhaps even more importantly, if there was a way to start to try to solve these problems. Well, that's wonderful. So, uh, I want you to now uh, scare our listeners as to really what's going on and share with what you what 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 you learned and what you exposed in your book and what what where's the hope out there after at the end of the show we're going to talk about all the hope hopefully that's out there and how we could change some of our behaviors and and and, and what we're used to but what did you learn and what did you put in the book about what we're exposed to on an everyday basis well one of the things I learned is that A huge number of the synthetic chemicals, and I stress the word synthetic because everything in the world is made up of chemicals, and the things that I write about in the book are materials that exist nowhere in nature. They wouldn't exist if they hadn't been invented in laboratories and designed to make very specific commercial products. So these aren't things you're going to find, you know, on their own floating around the ocean. They're, They're made by humans. Okay. And one of the things I learned that I was absolutely astonished by is that a lot of these materials, which we assumed would actually stay put, and a huge number of them turn up in plastics as flame retardants, as the chemicals that actually build the plastics themselves, things like polycarbonates and the chemicals that make um, what's called PVC, polyvinyl chloride, plastic flexible things that go into making nonstick surfaces and uh, grease-proof coatings and waterproof coatings, that these things that were assumed they would stay put in these finished products actually don't. Uh-huh. That over time, they little bits of these chemicals come off of finished products and, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. get into adjacent air. They can get attach themselves to dust and they can get into water and They move around the world. Some of them last a really long time, and so they can build up in food and in fat particularly, and they're getting into our bodies. So if that's, you know, and and this is fascinating stuff, so what we love to do is inform our listeners and inspire them 
to create change and to cre- create solutions in their own lives, but also on the, on, on a bigger platform. And so, you know, we had the Mike and I had a couple of weeks back the CEO of Seventh Generation on. And he was talking about all the household cleaning items that people typically have grown up with and use, and how those chemicals, most of them, have not even been approved by the FDA. So, take us a little bit through what are some of the most alarming chemicals that we're all exposed to in our day to day living. And and what can we do to avoid these uh, if there's such actions that can be taken? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the kind of chemicals that I just mentioned, flame, some of these flame retardants, these nonstick um, surface chemicals, the chemicals that make up polycarbonate plastics and go into PVC plastics, the worrisome thing about those chemicals is that they all, in different ways, can interact with hormones in living creatures, including us, and they can have adverse impacts on a whole host of really vital body systems from metabolism to reproduction, cardiovascular system, immune system, neurology. And these effects can be subtle, but they're serious. And in terms of what people can do, Already, because of widespread concern about these effects, there are now manufacturers who are offering alternative products to a lot of these materials. Boy, that's that's great news because uh, while you're talking about this, Lizzie, I'm, I'm thinking about, pardon me, especially nonstick. I love to cook. I know a lot of people that love to cook. Some people don't like cooking, but they love to eat. That's so me. to try and keep the calories down, you use nonstick That's cookware. Right. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, well, if it doesn't stick, if it's nonstick, by definition, I guess, well, maybe the chemicals are going to get loose into your food. Well, you know, I actually ended up doing a whole chapter on frying pans um, because I started seeing signs around that said eco-friendly nonstick pans, yeah. eco-friendly green pans. And one of the problems is that right now, under the system we have, it's almost impossible to find out exactly what goes into these materials. And I searched and searched and searched, and I'm a pretty dogged detective. (laughs) And I came away from this thinking that unless I'm cooking for somebody who can't tolerate a drop of oil or fat in their diet, I'm just going to use my really old-fashioned cast iron pans, because... You know, this stuff might be okay, some of it, but on the other hand, we just don't know. And that's one of the really big changes that has to happen is better, more transparent information. When you, In the book, you talk about green chemistry. What do you mean by that? Well, green chemistry is a really exciting, relatively new field. And the whole idea of it is to design materials that are environmentally safe and benign at every single stage of that product's life. And the whole idea behind it is that the best way of preventing chemical pollution and therefore of preventing any adverse health effects that might come with it is simply to design materials that are, as the scientists say, benign by design and safe from the very beginning to the end of when you could possibly want to use it. But is that something like out of a futuristic, like the Jetsons, or is that actually going to be available to our listeners and all of us in the coming months and years ahead from your studies? Well, there are already products based on green chemistry principles and that are, have, are actually inspired by how natural chemistry works that are already on the market. And you're in California, and yep. one of... My favorite story is from green chemistry, and there are lots of them, okay. is a California story, which is that it's actually California and Oregon. I live in Oregon. <laughs> um, a scientist who's here in Oregon actually invented an environmentally benign replacement for the formaldehyde-based glues that go into plywood. Hmm. And they became a really commercially successful product because California had um, raised indoor air quality standards that would make it um, not possible to use those older types of glues that released hazardous um, fumes. fumes into the air. So all of a sudden there was a big market for this safe product, and, yeah, it's based on green chemistry, and it actually won a presidential green chemistry award a couple years ago. Yeah, that's very cool because you walk into any place of business and you see Prop 65 warning talking about uh, there are certain 
hazardous chemicals that are in use in whatever business that you're walking into. So that's great for plywood. That's awesome. Yeah. And there, there are lots of other examples like that. Um, there are people who are working on making safe cleaning products, as you've mentioned, and there are quite a lot of those out there now. There are people who are working on making textiles that don't have to use hazardous dyes that uh, can create color the way uh, butterfly wings do. And there are all sorts of really innovative things out there. And it's going to take a little while till we have lots and lots of products, but the changes are happening uh, remarkably quickly. And your benign by design tagline, which I love, I've never heard that before, you're saying that's... Uh, a reason to hope that these products are, are being designed now to be benign and they're going to be coming more out to the marketplace in the very near future. Absolutely. I mean, for ex- I mean, I don't discuss lead particularly in my book, but right. the whole idea is really simple. If you never put lead into the paint that's going onto a toy, you never have to worry about how much of it your child might be exposed to it. So the idea is really simple. Got it. How about nanotechnology? What about nanotechnology that you learned and wrote about in your book? Well, one of the, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with what nanotechnology is, so I'll just describe that really briefly. It's, um, it's working with materials at an incredibly tiny size down at the atomic level. And when things get that small, and this is a really active area of, of promising research for a whole lot of different reasons, Because when things are that small, they behave entirely differently than they do at a larger size. And so materials get all sorts of unusual properties, and they can do all sorts of really interesting things. And nanotechnology is being used to develop some really specially targeted pharmaceuticals and some really novel materials that, for example, can be kind of self-knitting bandages. But they're also, we just don't know a lot about these materials yet. So on the one hand, they have a lot of promise for doing some really interesting resource-efficient um, chemistry. But at the same time, it seems as if we should be pretty careful about what I would call appropriate technology. Right. And, I mean, for example, there are a lot of... Um, clothes out there now that have um, antimicrobial, antibacterial, yeah. nano silver yes. in your socks. And yep. I just read a bunch of studies yeah. that came out that said this stuff is coming out in the wash. And oh. we don't really know what that's going to do yet. So there are scientists who are actually working both in green chemistry and in nanotechnology uh, trying to make sure we ask the hard questions about how materials behave environmentally before we get too terribly far along with them. So therefore, nanotechnology eventually could be an asset instead of a liability if you mix in the green chemistry thought thought leaders into that whole process. Exactly. Got it, exactly. got it. You know, I know when you write a book, and you've said this to me before, the massive amount of, t- uh, you know, uh, research you do that you know compared to what really ends up in the book when you did this the research on chasing molecules you know what were the one or two or three most alarming or surprising things that you learned while you were writing this book i'd love our listeners to to get the benefit of all that knowledge and research that you did well one of the most surprising things i learned um is about green chemistry and i learned this from one of the um, many really exciting, dynamic green chemistry scientists I talked to. They were just absolutely phenomenal, inspiring people. And one of them is a man named John Warner who works in Massachusetts. And one of the things I learned from him was that to this day, if you get a degree in chemistry and you're going to set off on a career as a professional chemist making new materials that are going to be used commercially, Never in your education are you required to take a course in ecology or any kind of environmental health science or toxicology that would teach you to ask the questions about how materials behave in the environment or how they behave biologically. Mm. And so John Warner told me that at a certain point in his career as a chemist, he'd realized he'd synthesized over 2,500 different molecules. He holds patents. Um, And at that point in his career, he had no idea what made a molecule toxic. And this just seemed 
absolutely wrong to him. And so that's what led him to help establish the field of green chemistry. Wow, so it's really all about a, a mindset change. Exactly. And green chemistry is really interesting because it's a set of principles rather than something like a set of standards like green building standards or organic food standards. So it really is very much a mindset, asking uh, scientists to ask questions that just typically haven't been asked before. You know, it's fascinating, Lizzie, that Mike and I have so many interesting folks on, CEOs and sci- you know, all from all different backgrounds. But this is the first time we're even hearing about green chemistry, and so, it's so fitting on green is good, but it makes sense what you're saying. What else did you learn? What else besides the green chemistry principles, what else uh, can you well, share with our listeners? I think one of the things that, uh, sort of, again, relating to green chemistry is that, I mean, it's, in a lot of ways, it just should be complete common sense. And it has a lot of benefits um, in terms of health and environment, but also for business because it advocates resource efficiency as well as um, environmental safety. Sure. And I guess one of the other sort of flip side of the equation um, I learned was on the impact side is just how many different chemicals are out in the world and how much they've changed how the world works, even though we can't see it. Mm. And that's pretty complicated, but um, I was just really impressed at how many people are out there studying these things and how these chemicals that we can't see are literally traveling all over the world. I went with scientists up to the Arctic who were tracking these you know, invisible molecules literally all around the world, and that just to me was kind of mind-boggling. So we love to be solution-based, so what advice do you give to our listeners who are very concerned about some of these invisible <laughs> chemicals, potentially hazardous invisible chemicals that we're being exposed to? What hope can you give them and what advice can you give them? Well, on the simple advice front, um, that's a question that I asked almost everybody I interviewed is, you know, what should, you know, people are going to say, what should I do? Sure. And first off, every single scientist I spoke to said, no need to panic, you know, just really nobody should be like terrified and scared, but make some good strategic choices. And they usually have to do with if you have children in the house, if you're feeding a baby, you have small children, choose products that avoid these chemicals. If you're choosing um, shatterproof baby bottles or children's sippy cups or dishware, pick ones that are not made from polycarbonate plastic that are going to be labeled BPA-free. They're out there. They're easy to find. If you have kids crawling on the floor, you might want to avoid brand new carpet that has flame retardants in it. Mm. I mean, it, it's possible to do that. Um, and so those are a couple of re- really easy strategic choices. And the good hope out there is that there's now a ton of information um, out there through some pretty simple um, websites, and I hate to tell everybody they have to go on a computer in order to find a safe toy, <laughs> but the information is actually out there. And in my ideal world, you'd never have to consult a database. Everything on the shelf would be safe. But there is some pretty easy to use um, um, information out there, and there are a ton of incredibly good, dedicated people working on making things even safer. And you know, Lizzie, it, it, thanks to your friend John Warner, I mean, there's a whole new consciousness developing among people who are studying chemistry right now. So the next crop and generation of chemists are going to have an entirely different mindset. Exactly. And the other thing I'd say, you know, these things don't happen quickly, but um, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, does have a whole green chemistry program, what's called Design for the Environment, and that's been very powerful in the field. Uh, John Shkarian works in and electronics. <laughs> Folks have, in just the past few years, started designing much better environmentally friendly products. Thanks in part to your great work with, well. uh, with the high-tech <laughs> trash. But, um, and the idea of creating safe products and making that part of the solution of getting some of these hazardous chemicals out of the equation is now um, part of virtually every uh, policy that's being put together um, 
from the state level to the federal level. And again, the stuff doesn't happen fast, but it's very much in the mindset. Well, you know, we got one minute left, and uh, and I just want to thank you, first of all, for coming on the show. But tell us, our, 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 leave our listeners with one last or two last pearls of wisdom and talk about are you optimistic uh, after you've written this book and a uh, wonderful book called Chasing Molecules. Uh, uh, leave us with a few uh, last thoughts. Well, I am, uh, actually, I am optimistic, and, and people keep, friends ask me, you know, after all you've learned about all these chemicals and all these adverse health effects, now, how come you're not depressed? And I said, well, I can be frustrated and angry that these things are out there, and I wish they weren't. But the thing that really makes me optimistic is that there's so, as I mentioned, there's so many people who are really dedicated to this and people who just intuitively get it because they're trying to do the right thing for their children and their households, that they're just really dedicated people working on this and getting the information out there. So that truly makes me optimistic. Well, Lizzie Grossman, Mike and I are honored to have you on our show today. The time always goes way too fast. (laughs) And to our listeners who would like to buy her wonderful new book, Chasing Molecules, you can find it at chasingmolecules.org or, of course, on Amazon.com or your local bookseller like Barnes & Noble. Lizzie Grossman, you not only talk the talk, but you truly walk the walk and are living proof that green is good. Well, thank you so much.